Halloween special, episode number 52. I'm, of course, one of your hosts, Mike, and tonight I'm joined by Chris. Hello! No, <laughs> I had to do my Joker voice. I've been playing on Batman. Hello, Gotham! Yeah, All right, something fair enough. And, uh, of course, we also have Chig. Uh, I will not be doing my Joker voice this evening. Sorry, guys. And then we also have Sam. Hello, I will not be doing my Harley Quinn voice because it is not yet perfected, but hi guys. <laughs> All right, good to have you here. So, um, yeah, what's been going on with everyone? Spiel, Essence Spiel. So I went on Thursday. Sam, you're going to come along maybe tomorrow? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. So biggest gaming trade fair slash convention also has a, uh, a comic convention that's not that big. Uh, takes place in Essen. Uh, shed loads of board games for all ages and CCGs and some RPGs and wargaming stuff. So I really kept mainly to the, like looking for the wargaming stuff and talking to some of the companies in person. Um, and if people are interested about that, they can go to our blog um, where we where I put up some pictures of some of the miniatures. Um, yeah, that's some interesting stuff, you know. Um, it says it all when every other company is uh, is there talking about their games and showing off what they've got. And Games Workshop are actually there for the first time in quite a few years. And their stand is basically nothing but loads of boxes filled with Forge World stuff to sell because they can't be asked doing like demo games or anything. Hmm. Interesting. I was expecting you were going to say it was just a bunch of like their regular boxes like here, buy the starter set. Well, no, cause they're not going to have that there because everyone else can sell that stuff right. and will be there selling it at a discount. So it doesn't serve their purpose to have that. They may as well take Forge World and just sell it at their normal markup. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of boring. So, um, so tomorrow will be discount day and I will be looking for a good bargain. Um, interesting board game. Uh, Mike, did you look at what I put up about that board game called Leaders? Uh, I looked at it briefly and saw that it was kind of it to me. Just looking at it at a glance, it really just seemed like it was a kind of a risk board game. So I'm interested to hear uh, what the what technology is going to be using to uh, make the rules and gameplay easier. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you're right. It's it's risk, but it has the elements, say, from Civ and an RTS game where you have uh, the tablet there managing all the tech trees and research and espionage and assassination and secret treaties and so forth. So it really allows you to have a hidden layer of gameplay that you're aware of so that if you wanted to have a treaty with someone yet sabotage their work, you can do that. Hmm. I like it. Nice. And then didn't you also run into uh, Mark Ryan.Hagen there? No, I found where his stand was, but he wasn't there at the time. So if I see him tomorrow, I see him tomorrow. But yeah. Okay. All right. I must have misinterpreted. Sweet. Yeah, sounds like a pretty good time. Um, I, uh, I might be going to a convention uh, in the not-so-distant future, uh, maybe TempleCon, which is down in Rhode Island, so not too far from me. And uh, there's a lot of uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle stuff there, so that could be uh, pretty sweet. How about you, Chig? How's the uh, Texas con scene looking? Uh, there is no Texas con scene. <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all right. That's why God invented uh, airplanes. Yep. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. And I think that's just about it for uh, our kind of little intro here. So let's move on over to White Wolf News. <laughs> Yeah, I probably should have said World of Darkness news, but okay, whatever. Onyx Path news. But uh, one book did come out. It is convention book, Void Engineers. Mm -hmm. And before Chig says anything, we're not going to talk about it right now. 
It definitely came out. It it definitely did. Is it good so far? I've not touched it yet. Chig, don't Mike say says anything. I can't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> it's good then. Chig, should we say something about that? Uh, you told me not to say anything. So right, that means I'm I can say something. It is yeah, not what I expected. Kind of what I expected. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, it wasn't what I expected. Anyway, okay. uh, that's about it for uh, new releases and the like. Um, yeah, uh, no Kickstarters lately. That's a little surprising. Where's my Anarchs Unchained? Where, where's my Demon the Descent? Mm. Update on the uh, Changing Breeds Kickstarter. They say that the PDF should be available shortly. Oh, that's cool. That's good. Stu Wilson never fails us. Never fails us. David Hill is editing the Werewolf 25th Anniversary cookbook right now. So, yeah, that's happening and is carrying a lot, you know, steadily going along. So, um, yeah, um, I think there was some news about maybe a little bit about Exalted, I think about a preview I've yet to look at about character creation and so a little bit of insight into the rules again there so I will have a look and see what I find out all right cool and uh yeah that's pretty much it for uh White Wolf World of Darkness Onyx Path news I think and uh, we already basically covered no we didn't cover all of World of Darkness news because well Chris you've been at uh Essence Spiel, and you've got lots of nice photos and a pretty solid blog post, so people should definitely check that out, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, and hopefully I'll get some more pictures um, tomorrow of anything else I think that deserved more of a picture. I think, yeah, there's lots of decent stuff going on. There's a lot of good board games. I'm kind of getting bored of, <laughs> to use the <laughs> pun not intended, kind of a bit bored of... Um, zombie themed games and steampunk themed games uh you know it's just kind of like really come on be a bit more creative yeah i definitely have to agree but um if it's easy money then the game companies are going to go for it yeah I mean, steampunk is for some reason quite popular yeah it's kind of in right now and I think uh, I think the last bit of uh, Darker Days news would be um, that we've had a bit of discussion going on on both uh, Google Plus and Facebook about you know kind of episode lengths and uh, mm. and all that. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback that people like the length, some people like it shorter, some people want it broken up, and uh, I'm not sure what exactly what we're going to do about that yet. But a common trend, a common side comment throughout all of this, was that people want you know these secret frequency anthologies. And that's what we're going to give you tonight. So here we go. Tonight is a triple threat of secret frequencies. I'll be presenting one, Chig will get one, and then of course Chris. So, I think with that, let's move on over to the first secret frequency presented by Chris. It's under the stairs. Oh, sweet. Secret It's kind of a two-part of mine, and it's part of the fact that I plan to run Geist at the Cineters set in Paris. Um, I've, we've been to Paris like once. Yeah, just yeah, the one. Just the one. <laughs> um, and, you know, Versailles and Paris, it's steeped in history. And so I kind of went looking for something, and we found a website that had a few interesting bits. And from there, I have learned a little bit about Paris's uh, alchemical history. So, La Verge of Nicolas Flamel. So, uh, one of the two oldest buildings in Paris, uh, and in particular the one I'm about to talk about, was built in 1407, was home to the legendary alchemist Nicolas Flamel, who is said to have created the Philosopher's Stone, the magical rock which has the properties necessar necessary for eternal youth. It also, of course, the same uh, material can turn lead into gold. And of course, Flamel apparently performed this trick three times. Now, uh, Flamel uh, had this inn where he would, uh, where he was, because he was a charitable man, and so he would attend to the poor and give them some of his riches. And he did this up until he died. And then he apparently, though, before his death, buried his philosopher's stone basement of this building and apparently digging up this philosopher's stone 
is not recommended. Interestingly enough, the building now is occupied by a restaurant. Let's learn a bit though, uh, a bit more about Nicholas Flamel. Uh, he lived uh, around about 1330 to 1418. He was a successful French scrivener and manuscript seller. So, you know, he was able to read and he was able to write and he was able to uh, copy documents. And of course, after his death, his reputation as, a, as an alchemist grew, and in particular, uh, in accounts that uh, date to the 17th century. Um, what more can we say about him? Well, his there's a numerous texts uh, that are ascribed to Flamel, and he is also he's also written numerous uh, alchemical treatises. Um, the historical Flamel lived in Paris in the 14th and 15th century. Uh, he ran two shops. He uh, he was married, and they were apparently good Catholic people. Uh, Flamel lived to his 80s, which, if you consider the time, is pretty damned impressive. Um, and he also, in 1410, designed his own tombstone, uh, which is carved with the images of Christ, Saint Peter, and Saint Paul. And he his tombstone is preserved at the Musée de Cluny in uh, Paris. Uh, records show that Flamel died in 1418 uh, and he was buried there and his will dated in, to, uh, in 22nd of November 1416 indicates that he was generous and that he did not have extraordinary, the extraordinary wealth of later alchemical legend. So he was a real person. Legendarily, though, he's he's, uh, he's accounted for uh, certain works such as the Livre, uh, Livre des Figures Hieroglyphiques, so basically the book of figures of hieroglyphics. And within this book are apparently how you create a philosopher's stone, how you perform alchemy, and certain other things. And also, he was able to create the elixir of life. And so he and his wife are apparently immortals and exist to this day. The book is interesting because um, there are there's also it was uh, translated into English, and it also from it uh, contains designs which were commissioned by Flamel for a uh, tim. Uh, let me get this right. To Panum. So this is like a, an archway. Uh, a particularly good example of one of these archways is the uh, front, the front entrance to the uh, Notre Dame in Paris. So, uh, and upon that, and it's reputed and it's notorious for it, is this archway has numerous carvings which are alchemical in nature. So he has numerous of these uh, designs which record, you know, alchemy. If we carry on then, he reputed to have travelled to Spain for assistance in translation of his original book, um, as he was you know, in translation so he could create his books, um, and he met a sage who identified uh, the book that was being copied as um, the, orig the original book being the book of uh, Abramelin the Mage. Uh, with this knowledge, over the next few years, Flamel and his wife decoded enough of the book to replicate the recipe for the philosopher's stone. Um, what else can we say about that? Flamel achieved legendary status, in, and you know, with references in Isaac Newton's journals, uh, the Catechus and the Dragons of Flamel, and of course, he's referenced in the 19th century by Victor Hugo. In the in the uh, book Hunchback of Notre Dame, because of course we go back to the fact that the archways of Notre Dame are notorious as being being this uh, literally the the work of alchemy uh, is is upon there for everyone to see. It's a very interesting uh, character. So as Victor Hugo said about uh, the door, front door of Notre Dame, he called it the page of a conjuring book written in stone. And there, are, if you do a bit of of research and, and googling, you'll find that Notre Dame has various different architectural or carvings and so forth, all relating to alchemy, Freemasonry, 
uh, and there's things encoded where certain letters are in bold or, or larger than others because they're actually numbers. And so there's this idea of 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 some of that Notre Dame is is a building with with alchemy and magic encoded within it, which when you think about it makes sense because you know, you've got a bunch of Catholics, they want to kill a bunch of wizards for doing dark arts, so what do you do? You, you basically hide in plain sight. Another interesting church, if we're going to talk about Paris, is l'église de Saint-Marie. Uh, Saint so this was uh, built from 1520, completed 1612. Uh, apparently one of the oldest and oddest churches in Paris and at the entrance has an androgynous horned gargoyle. Uh, the gargoyle has its male erection and female breasts so it's quite a curiosity on the front of the church. Uh, its cross legs are suggestive uh, of geomancy and the art of divination so it's a figure that um, that creates a shape most probably of a, uh, a five-pointed star and so this leads to the idea that some historians think that the church was linked to the Knights Templar and upon the inside of the church there is the presence of an inverted pentagram drawn on the walls and so this church also has the name of the Église de Diable or the Church of the Devil. So we can then move on and talk about another interesting alchemist because this alchemist also uh, apparently has a book about the alchemy and mysteries of the church, churches of Paris and this is Fulcanelli. So he was around, around you know, lived around the times of the 1920s. Uh, he was an East Turk author as well. His name is a play on words, Vulcan, ancient god of fire, El, a Canite god of the sacred fire. Uh, Falconelli has a, you know, has almost a cult, is a cultural phenomenon, um, and he apparently had a number of pupils, and he performed a transmutation of hundred grams of lead into gold uh, at, in the laboratory of the gasworks of Sarcelles at uh, the Georgi Company with the use of small quality of what was known as projection powder. So he apparently performed transmutation before researchers, scientists, in, a, in an actual laboratory. Um, Falconelli was apparently French, it was, was French but had numerous different uh, identities that he made use of. Uh, his a book that, is, that had about 300 copies in its first edition is Le Mystery de Cathedrales and as a, contains the mysteries of cathedrals, the hidden law, and about the arts and science and architecture within them. Um, he, as I said, he apparently had numerous identities, possibly being a former uh, a member of the former royal family, the uh, Valois. Is that correct, sir? Pronunciation? Um. Yes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Just get this right, because what's shit pronunciation on this show sometimes? <laughs> um, he was also a member of the uh, Frère de Heliopolis, so the Brotherhood of Heliopolis. Uh, apparently a society centers around him and his students. Uh, he also apparently could have been uh, Jules Viol, the French physicist. Um, and apparently his writings are similar to Jean Julien Hubert Champagne. So uh, there's similarities and so forth that create quite a complex character here. So if we carry on and we look at what gets really interesting about this guy, it's apparently that either he had a, a master who taught him alchemy, called Basil Valentine, or his or Fulcanelli's own wife was the master of alchemy that taught it to Fulcanelli. Um, and where it gets interesting is that during August 1945 after World War II and the liberation of Paris, uh, the American G2 Army Intelligence uh, asked uh, a guy called Bergier to contact a certain uh, army major who was in charge of the operation of searching and discovering German research reports into atomic energy. So there's the idea that army intelligence was looking for Canelli. Uh, 
with relation to the German research into atomic energy. Apparently, of course, uh, Fulcanelli could not be found. So, if we delve into this Jacques Zabergier, who knew Fulcanelli, Fulcanelli um, basically had a communication with Jacques Zabergier, which was to warn the French atomic physicist André Hellbormer uh, about man's impending use of nuclear weapons. According to Fulcanelli, nuclear weapons have been used before by and against humanity. So that's rather suggestive of, you know, ancient atomic bombs or something. Hellbronner uh, and uh, Chevillion, uh, uh, among others, were assassinated by the Gestapo towards the end of World War II. So in this meeting uh, with uh, between Jacques Berger and Fulcanelli in the laboratory of the gas board in Paris, um, Fulcanelli told Berger, and this apparently is a translation from the verbatim transcript, you're on the brink of success, as indeed are several, uh, several other of your scientists today. Please allow me, be very, very careful. I warn you, the liberation of nuclear power is easier than you think, and the radioactivity artificially produced can poison the atmosphere of our planet in a very short time, or a few years. Moreover, atomic explosives can be produced from a few grains of metal, enough to destroy whole cities. I'm telling you this for a fact. The alchemists have known it for a very long time. I shall not attempt to prove to you what I'm now going to say, but I ask you to repeat it to Monsieur Hellbronner. Certain geometrical arrangements of highly purified metals are enough to release atomic forces without having recourse to either electricity or vacuum techniques. The secret of alchemy is this, there is a way of manipulating matter and energy so as to produce what modern scientists call a field of force. This field acts on the observer and puts him in a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the universe. From this position, he has access to the realities which are ordinarily hidden from us by time and space, matter and energy. This is what we call the great work. When Berger asked Fulcanelli about the Philosopher's Stone, the alchemist answered, The vital thing is not the transmutation of metals, but that of the experimenter himself. It is, an, it is an ancient secret that a few people rediscover each century. Unfortunately, only a handful are successful. So, in the, af uh, the aftermath of this is during uh, December 1938, the German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann sent a manuscript of Naturwissenschaften, uh, which basically means natural sciences, reporting they had detected uh, the element barium after bombarding uranium with neutrons. Uh, and this is interpreted as being uh, the basis behind nuclear fission. So, Paris, alchemy, and the uh, very, very nature of chemistry, physics, science, and untapped energies this is certainly of use for numerous games. Um, my immediate thoughts uh, before we talk about Old World Starbucks is New World Starbucks. We have the game Promethean created. And of course, Alchemy appears a lot within that game. Uh, because Prometheans themselves are performing a form of alchemy where they are, uh, are purifying uh, Azoth and uh, and eventually ca causing a transmute mutation within themselves to create a human soul. And one of the types of Prometheans that occurs in one of the later supplements, it allows you to play Prometheans who are powered by atomic energy. So normally Prometheans are aligned with uh, earth, fire, water, air, and, and spirit, soul, energy. And, um, and so obviously with the, the the four humours and so forth. And you could then use the ideas that Fulk, what Fulcanelli is suggesting that atomic weaponry has been used in the past at some point, that there are examples in ancient history of, of um, atomic Prometheans. Of course, we could also uh, make use of this with respect to uh, to uh, games such as uh, Mage the Awakening. So, 
uh, the, par uh, the Church of Notre Dame has within it a secret ready to be unlocked, and, and maybe uh, what Fulcanelli was talking about, about this uh, atomic weapons being used in the past, is maybe referring back to the original war between mages that led to the collapse of the Celestial Ladder, which allowed mages, to, the Exarchs themselves, to, tra uh, to transcend into, into the supernal realms and take the uh, thrones of reality. Um, of course, alchemy brings us to Gnosticism, and so maybe these are the sort of secrets which uh, a few people know, uh, which may be used as weapons against the God Machine, and maybe the Philosopher's Stone that um, that uh, Nicholas Flamel uh, left behind actually sits in a place that's that's very important because it maybe blocks a infrastructure created by the God Machine in the past. Um, yeah. Any other ideas, guys, or anything else? Anything else historical that I need to? We can link in with all this. Anything else from? I mean, I guess you could link. The, the, there's there's the element with the whole um, uh, uh, with with Volc uh, with Fulcanelli that you can relate that to Mage Noir, uh, Mage Noir, and so there's a good like you know kind of you can play with like that spy element quite happily. Um, yeah, what do you think? One thing that struck me is uh, just the idea of the Philosopher's Stone being created somewhere in Paris and, well, being buried at some point. So what you could do uh, very easily with Wraith the Oblivion is have that Philosopher's Stone turn up as a relic in the Shadowlands. And that itself uh, could provide a lot of very strange possibilities since it's something dealing mostly with life and now it's in the land of death. And how might that affect Wraiths that uh, encounter it? or um, how may it be desired by people in the Skinlands. Uh, another thing I was kind of playing around with um, is, uh, of course, Paris is famed for its, for its catacombs, and yet you have these philosophers, these alchemists, that are um, trying so hard to have eternal youth and eternal life. And one thing you could play off of, and uh, maybe relate this to some of the ideas presented in the, uh, the Immortals source book for New World of Darkness, mm -hmm. is, uh, well, what if these immortals they're able to keep up their their youth and their power not by stealing life but perhaps being fueled by death and uh using that in the alchemical rituals that drive them oh so they're ghost eating that's rather cool because then that fits in quite well with um you use that in guys of sin eaters and the idea that they the dis the disturbed ghosts that you have are acting out because the ghosts are essentially being hunted by the living or the immortal okay that's kind of cool yeah, yeah. And the uh, the Falconelli thing about, about atomics is actually it's really interesting to think about. Um, as you mentioned, yes, it could have been used in the past at some point. It would have had to have been used in the past for the alchemists to know its its true power uh, through experimentation. So, how, like, wh where did this happen? When? Uh, what place was destroyed? Was it a city? Was it uh, was it a mountain? Maybe maybe Pompeii was actually an atomic being set off. Uh, Santorini, um, that's another good one, so that's another, uh, and that leads to the Atlantis myths as well. Um, I was going to say, uh, if you want to talk about Mummy the, the Curse, uh, maybe the Atomics was actually what took out Irem and turned it into a desolate, uh, you know, turned it to, to ashes and to a desert. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I like that a lot. And another thing with uh, Promethean the Created is um, it could be interesting to have uh, Zika, the atomic Prometheans, be created uh, in different ages of history yeah, by atomics yeah. being set off. And then they are, maybe some of them are, uh, are become human again, but maybe a lot of them are just hunted down and destroyed because they are such a blight on the landscape. I mean, even the regular Created don't want them to exist because it hurts the Earth so much. It's a bit of a stretch, but... Uh... If we go to the old world of darkness, we could say that the uh, the atomics were used to destroy the second city of the vampires. Oh yeah, that would be that would be really good. I was gonna Since I was thinking along the idea of that. That's that's also where, according to I think it's the Ursia's fragments, that's where generation began. Before that, everybody was the same power level. Um, maybe the atomics are an allegory for. Uh, or the Half-Life, rather, is an allegory for the weakening of vampires over the ages. Yeah. 
Uh, the other spin I was going to give was um, maybe another example of atomics is, or at least some form of controlled atomics, or like uh, rather than uh, rather than a fission bomb, you're talking maybe, a, or even an example of a fusion bomb, because I don't see why alchemists wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, Tunguska incident is another great example. Um, you also have the medieval, um, what they call the medieval, the 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 small. Hold on, wait up. Small, the small ice age. So maybe the small ice age was actually due to that. Uh, the explosion of Krakatoa. Well, there's new. You can go through and find numerous events where you go. That could have actually been just some alchemist, you know, popping off a, a a nuke for some reason to kill some ancient demon or or vampire or mage or whatnot. And yeah, I mean, the the other thing I I think it's really cool is just the idea of like so much knowledge being of being being seen in plain sight the other things you can then tie into with this if you want to get into that is obviously uh, the other things that are related kind of is you get the 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 urban legend that the the pyramid uh, for in the Louvre um, is meant to have 60 666 panes of glass it doesn't Okay, that's just a that's just a myth. But these are all little things which obviously wonderfully turn up in Dan Brown's books because you know how he likes his uh, likes his likes to take things uh, to the extreme. Um, the other thing I was thinking, which relates to maybe uh, with regard to one of Victor Hugo's works, is with the French Revolution type work uh, in Les Mis. I mean, that could be a great example of like. The rival that can be used as a great event to represent the rivalry between different warring groups. Like behind these people, there could be a, a further shadow war going on. Can you expand well, on that, um, Sam? About well, first of all, I just want to clarify that uh, Les Mis is not about the French Revolution. Oh, sorry, no, no, sorry. No. It's about uh, the June Rebellion, and uh, that happened sometime after the French Revolution when there was a king back on the throne and people were very happy about it. So they tried for another revolution and the June Rebellion was actually a failed revolution because everyone who participated died. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's all I wanted to correct you on there. Yeah, sorry, I, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is tied to the French Revolution. And did that see... I'm just wondering with that, I mean, that's that's a cool time period, I think that's a cool time period to maybe look at, say, again as a role play example, because we now have a wonderful film which which gives a good portrayal of it, and I think with New Order Darkness's upcoming uh, Dark Eras, you could use it quite well for, say, Mage or, or Vampire, um, it would work kind of nice in that sense. Well, I'm a big Les Mis fan, so I'm quite biased, but I think that the look of the movie is really inspirational for those kind of games, really. Whether you like musicals or not, is another matter entirely. I think it'd be a really good, it'd also be a very good example uh, setting for Mage the Ascension, because you can really see the, the, the revolutionaries themselves could be again kind of the traditions where it's like you know the military and, and the government have kind of that technocracy that's slowly working out all the kind of superstitious crap out of their system mm, mm. yeah i concur chris uh alchemy itself provides this really interesting uh, dichotomy between the traditionalist mages and the technocracy or well the order of reason at the time so it's really a perfect setting for a um, mage and sorcerer's crusade putting it in paris where you have these uh, two factions looking at similar things, the science of chemistry and the uh, more liberal arts of alchemy. I just thought, crazily, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, what's the Hunchback? The Hunchback's a Promethean. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> there we go, he's not just a Nosferatu, he's a Promethean. Um, yeah, I think that's about it on that one. I can't think, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, we've got loads more to do on Paris. I've got loads more to read and to find and to go back and to look at, actually. To go back to Paris and actually look at some of these things and actually go in the catacombs. Um, who else? Is, and actually go to some of the cemeteries. Who's famous? It's Morris, um, who's buried in Paris? <laughs> A lot of people are buried. A lot of people are buried. Famous people. We've got Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde yeah. 
that's pretty much the one I definitely want. So, you know, again, I, it's, Paris is also great for Geist as well. Um, yeah, that's about it, I think. Yep, I think so as well. Jake, you got anything to say? Wasn't one of these guys a uh, mage and uh, a hermetic? Uh, yeah, Flamel was definitely mentioned in one of the Order of Hermes books at one point. Yes. Um, also, he was in Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's briefly mentioned, isn't he? But, I mean, yeah. Cool. Alright, cool. So, with that, let's move on over to the next secret frequency. Something terrible haunts the ruins of Leap Castle in Ireland. It is a primal force, horrifying beyond description, which has dwelled within the castle walls for centuries, if not longer. It waits in the darkest shadows for unnatural forces or spilled blood to awaken it, or for a foolish human to rouse its anger. In the past, the spirit was known as the Thing. Today, it is known as the Elemental. Among the many ghosts that roam the halls of Leap Castle, the Elemental is perhaps the oldest and most intriguing resident. This primitive ghost's origins and its exact nature are unknown, and as such, parapsychologists and paranormal investigators can only speculate as to where the bestial spirit came from and what its agenda may be. However, the Elemental's origins seem to be connected to the castle's own bloody past. Uh, many theories regarding its grotesque apparition have circulated over the years, but it is unknown if any of them are even close to the truth. Exactly when the Elemental first appeared seems to be lost to history, but there have been vague reports of an animalistic apparition that has appeared since the castle's earliest days. So, uh, one theory states that the Elemental is actually a summoned druidic spirit uh, that came to this plane and is bound to the site by rituals. Uh, it was done so to protect the druids and uh, the site itself and any magical rites that were being performed there. Such a ritual uh, would have required many sacrifices, with uh, human blood, of course, being the most potent uh, focus of power. Such sacrifices might have empowered the spirit, giving it uh, the necessary power to ward off the enemies of the castle's inhabitants. Uh, perhaps the elemental itself has become weakened and is seeking fresh blood to renew its strength and uh, maintain its existence here on the uh, material plane. Also, it's uh, important to bring up that uh, Leap Castle is, of course, an island, which itself has many vampire legends. So uh, you can also look to the folklore for additional ideas. Some also believe that the elemental may have been placed within the castle by invading uh, enemy forces, whether it be uh, the English or someone else, maybe the Spanish as they came to Ireland. Um, it has long been said that the perpetrator was Gerald Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare. Uh, it is widely renowned that uh, Fitzgerald was a practitioner of the dark arts. You know, easy stuff like necromancy and summoning demons. Uh, and if this is be to be believed, of course, summoning and binding a spirit within the castle would have been within his capabilities. Uh, historically, Fitzgerald actually tried to seize the castle on many different occasions, but he failed each time. Other people believe that the elemental's manifestation may be uh, been connected to the gruesome discoveries in the castle's oubliette, a horrible uh, dungeon which uh, can only be accessed by a trap door. Lying on the floor of the dungeon is a number of long iron spikes meant to impale those that have been pushed into the dark pit. It was here that Tad Coach O'Carroll, uh, after having capacitated many dinner, de dinner guests of the Omehan clan uh, with drugged food and wine, had each of them flung into the oubliette. Uh, those who remained conscious, uh, of course, begged to be thrown into the pit upside down, hoping to avoid death uh, by impalement, instead just having their necks broken as they hit the hard, cold stone floor. It wasn't until the uh, mid-1920s that the previously sealed dungeon was actually opened, and a truly horrible discovery was made. Uh, inside the oubliette uh, were many skeletal remains of 150 people, uh, which actually took four cartloads uh, to be cleaned out. It's thought that the removal of these more remains may have actually caused the uh, elemental to manifest uh, due to the, the dormant emotional anguish of the restless spirits. 
Uh, another theory, uh, quite similar to the last, is that uh, the elemental may be a thought form, which uh, is not created by the dead, but uh, actually from the collective thoughts and emotions of the living, uh, perhaps generated by those uh, people, the Omehan clan, as they're being thrown down into the pit. Another local legend says that the elemental uh, is actually a ghost of an ancient O'Carroll who died of leprosy within the castle. The local folk reason that uh, the spirit's, uh, you know, stunning stench is actually caused by uh, the decaying flesh of the uh, O'Carroll that previously died. So, that's a lot of theories, and all of them are quite applicable to the world of darkness itself. You could really just take any of those and just run with it. Um, but let's look at a couple of uh, different ways that the elemental could be used in various games and uh, what challenges uh, the player characters might encounter. So one idea is actually that he may himself just be uh, one of the deathless, a mummy. Uh, and uh, as he awakens, because he's been uh, disturbed somehow or a uh, relic has been moved, um, you, they find, these, these individuals exploring the castle, find this sort of decomposing being that's wandering around. And that itself could very simply be a mummy. Um, another idea is that this creature may only partially exist in the material world, but may uh, itself be uh, a more permanent resident of the Shadowlands of Wraith the Oblivion. And perhaps this creature actually feeds off of the uh, pathos of Wraiths. And uh, this makes it a great antagonist for this location because um, while this castle, with all of its death, may have a uh, very thin uh, gauntlet to cross over into the Shroud, or a very thin shroud to cross over between worlds, uh, making it a perfect haunt for a circle of wraiths. But this being is uh, there watching over it. So guys, uh, what do you think of this? It's a rather strange spirit, and uh, I'm just curious uh, what ideas you might have. When you said a castle, the first thing that popped into my head is... Um... I don't know if, if you've ever seen it, it's, it's a really good program to watch if you want to have a list of all the things horror ever, and they seem to have it every year on Channel 4, or, or the 100 greatest horror moments on TV. No, they've only had, they only had the one, as far as I know. But well, they show it seem every they, year, don't they? No, they don't. Oh, well. No, I, wish I thought they did. did. But they should do an updated version, because that was about 10 years ago they did that. So, but yeah. one of the programs that they one of the most horrific moments of tv and film and so forth that they had is um something known as a, a bbc show called um like film short you know, t, made for tv film called the stone tape oh the stone tape yeah <laughs> and it reads kind of similar in the sense that you've got this old place that has ghosts manifesting and when they investigate it the ghosts are actually due to something that is far, far more ancient that is locked into the building. So I was thinking the same thing with this, and Mike, you're right when you said like something that's preying on the ghost's pathos. So again, that takes the idea of, you said something that's something from the Deadland that was never dead. So in Wraith, I don't know what they're quite called. I know in Geist that they, they, you can have something called Chthonians that come from the very the very depths of, uh, of the underworld, the never born. You know, they, they're dead, but they were never born. Mm -hmm. um, they never existed in the real world. You could then go to the next step. You could, if you want to go for something for, for werewolf, the forsaken, you obviously have um, the Yidigam. Uh, again, it's always a good thing. This could, again, this creature could be uh, a manifestation of, an, of, of a creep of this Yidigam as it's needing to hunt now that the ghosts have been taken away. Um, the dungeon you were talking about obviously could be an Avernian gate to part of the underworld where this, uh, where this spirit or where this, uh, where this Chthonian comes from. Um, maybe the creature is also the, the, the elemental, maybe it's a ghost mage. So in Mage the Awakening, you can have antagonists that are actually the ghosts of mages. And so, you know, it, it's been gathering so many souls ready to perform whatever diabolical uh, act it needs to bring itself back into uh, reality and to live again. Uh, 
you could quite happily see, uh, I, I can't think of which compact or conspiracy, but someone from a group from Hunter setting up shop there to, to do enough research to, to make use of this gateway to the underworld to create ectoplasmic uh, powered weaponry to fight the dead. Uh, so it's kind of like mining the underworld. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a no-brainer, but you could, you could definitely see, you know, some vampire maybe wanting to set up shop or does actually live there and has been feasting for generations on the slowly decaying dead in the bottom of this dungeon and is a vampire that is utterly inhuman. Nice, I like it. Another idea I had was that uh, this provides a very interesting challenge for Prometheans because typically when, uh, you know, in your standard World of Darkness Ooh. game, when your group of player characters run across an antagonist like this, they're going to do some research. But there's very little material on this being, and really, how are the Prometheans going to find this all out? Because they're going to have to talk to other people. Um, it provides many simply social challenges for them uh, and their own disquiet. The castle itself would have a very interesting um, spiritual reflection. It would be known as either a wound or a shoal in the uh, in the in the hissel. So obviously, uh, if you were if you were a werewolf in the um, in the shadow outside of of the castle, I'm sure it'd be a, a horrific place that's that is being you know that's home to like death spirits and spirits of decay and and so forth. And the castle itself would be potentially some ginormous gothic thing constructed of bone and flesh. Um, and the same could be said then about it. It's, uh, it's either its uh, reflection in the, the Shadowlands of Wraith. It would be, also be. It would also have a quite a infernal looking um, uh, reflection. And maybe the, the castle itself is completely inverted, and, and within uh, Geistersinitas, that inverted castle is um, is a domain. So uh, there's a caraboy there, and maybe that caraboy would be the type of type of entity to go talk to because it actually wants to get the elemental back into its domain because that that creature should not have escaped into the real world um which makes me think of something else um maybe the elemental is actually a creature from the inferno and it's spent so long feasting on things and now it's run out I like it. All right, Sam. So, does this castle or this elemental give you any ideas for a character to play? Hmm. Well, I'd probably have to think about it quite a bit, to be honest, because I don't really come up, come up with characters like out of thin air, but um, it, I think it would give me a few ideas, but I'm not really sure how to articulate them at the moment. <laughs> you can always write them up in a blog for us. Yeah, I probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because all right. Yeah, um, I guess character-wise, I mean, you've obviously got maybe people that have some blood tied to the people of the of the lands around it and the people yeah. that lived in the castle. We could do the we could do the the paranormal researcher. Yeah, like I think maybe that's a little bit contrived. Maybe. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> All right, sounds good. And uh, of course, Chig, hit me with the uh, changeling, the dreaming explanation. <laughs> well, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, my initial thought was that it was a, uh, a red cap or a group of red caps who were protecting their freehold. Uh, changelings reincarnate over the centuries, so that explains why they've been there for so long. Uh, but actually, I think I would, if I was going to do this in the old world of darkness, I would go with the uh, uh, a werewolf tribe. Uh, it's in uh, the British Isles, as you said, and that is the traditional stomping grounds of uh, the uh, White Howlers, or as they are now known, the uh, Black Spiral Dancers. Uh, this this strikes me obviously as a cairn controlled by the Black Spiral Dancers. Right. So the, the elemental would then be just some uh, just some worm upset spirit, uh, worm spirit, spirit that's protecting its 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 house. Yeah. Ah, interesting. 
I like could it. also I like the thing with the changing one because that also made me think of for changing or lost it could be a uh, it could be a freehold or, or, or some sort uh, which is a freehold of constant autumn and so you can imagine it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it has a reflection in the hedge itself and you know, you basically th- this uh, this this elemental is due to these changelings creating fear so they can feed upon it to create more glamour and you know you've basically got somewhere hidden in the hedge linked to this castle are quite happily living a fair amount of autumn courtiers mm-hmm. maybe the scarecrow ministry has their headquarters there could be I like it I like it Nice. Uh, any other comments on the elemental of Leap Castle? How did you say it exactly manifests again? It's sort of this rotting spirit. It's very, very vague. I haven't been able to find a uh, consistent or very descriptive, um, well, description of it. Hmm. Hmm. It Apparently seems very stinks. reminiscent. I was going to say, it seems very reminiscent of the Belgian one with the uh, the woods with the fog. Yeah, it kind of is. Um, what it seems to be to me is that uh, people, they, they'd smell the stench when they were exploring the castle, and then they did find all those bodies down in the uh, trap door. So, realistically, outside of the world of darkness, there's probably people just being a little creeped out and then also smelling the rotting decay from all those bodies underneath the castle. Mm. which is itself a, a good it could be all, all just a red herring and that's really what's going on in your game they just find this horrible but completely mundane secret inside the castle oh actually that's a good idea tulpas so a tulpa is as you say is a thought form uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, Himalayan thing isn't it mm-hmm. so it's um, maybe I say it's, it's kind of like a, a consensual thing where so many people think that there is something there that it becomes real. Um, it reminds me of there's an episode of Angel, the series, uh, when um, it's a, a flashback to uh, it's when Angel has moved into the hotel, he's moved into the hotel, and he's actually been to the hotel before because he stayed there in the 30s. And um, there's a demon which manifests uh, due to the paranoia of all the people staying in the hotel. And they think that Angel is a murderer because there's, there's murders going on in the hotel, but they're actually suicides. And the demon feeds on their anxiety. So it could be an anxiety yeah. demon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Nice. I like it. All right, good. I think that's it for the elementals. So let's go on over to our final secret frequency of the night. All right, I want to preface this topic by uh, getting a little disclaimer here. This is a potentially sensitive topic as it covers a group of people who actually exist in the real world. Uh, I will try to cover them uh, with uh, respect, uh, no disrespect is intended, and uh, at the end, of course, we will be fictionalizing them for the purposes of entertainment in a game. Uh, the group of people I refer to are known as the Indigo Children. Uh, this is a group of uh, people who have been born since uh, the late 1970s, 1978 and onward. Uh, they are described by some as being the uh, next step in human evolution. Uh, They are said to have many different psychic powers, including um, the ability to see dead people or angels. Uh, They are characterized as having high IQs, uh, heightened intuition, uh, being overly sensitive and not uh, enjoying being touched by others. Uh, They're resistant to authority. Uh, they are called indigo children because uh, when they were discovered and described in the uh, early 80s by a psychic by the name of Nancy Ann Tapp, 
Uh, she uh, described him as having a deep blue or indigo aura. Uh, it's believed that they are empathic. But they uh, have uh, trouble with authority and have uh, are described as having an obvious sense of self. They know who they are and what they like, and they are, they are here for a purpose. Like I said, this is a, a real-world phenomenon, and uh, in the real world, it's often uh, their uh, I don't know where their traits are often ascribed to uh, people who have been uh, diagnosed with uh, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, and uh, those who claim that indigo children are are an actual thing uh, say that uh, this is a misdiagnosis and that treating them with uh, ADHD drugs such as Ritalin uh, can sever their connections to uh, the spirit world. Uh, now, in the world of darkness, there are many things that these uh, children can be. Uh, in the old world of darkness, uh, they could be mediums or psychics or uh, sorcerers. In werewolf, they could be uh, kami, uh, spirits of Gaia who are put here for a reason, uh, whichever reason Gaia has in mind for them. Uh, they could be Fomori. Uh, children who were born uh, worm-tainted and uh, possessed by uh, an evil spirit. Uh, Mage has uh, a, uh, a history of uh, reincarnated avatars. Uh, during the Himalayan Wars between the uh, uh, Akashic Brotherhood and the uh, Euthanatos, uh, they uh, used their individual group uh, mastery of reincarnation to reincarnate uh, with their knowledge of their previous lives and uh, sometimes fully awakened. This could be another example of that. Uh, in Changeling, uh, the Shi, the ruling class of the Changeling society, are um, not really uh, changelings in the traditional sense. They did not undergo the changeling way ritual. Uh, they are kind of body snatchers. So it's possible that they are born in these uh, indigo children, uh, fully awakened as she. The thing I would go with, say with um, oh, convention book progenitors, which is obviously the biopharmaceutical end of the technocracy. And within that book, it talks about how, you know, from our point of view, the technocracy won the essential war against major so Science is the reality. Yet, the progenitors have the ability to cure every ill and ailment that is plaguing mankind. Yet, mankind is too uh, curmudgeonly and, uh, you know, too too pessimistic to, to want to see see this utopia coming to being. So um, the other thing I was thinking then is maybe indigo children, rather than use them as a, as a monster or, or something that I think could be, which kind of in some respects, you know, if you think that cheapens what they, they really represent, maybe in World of Darkness, in the old World of Darkness, they're representative of, um, they're another manifestation of humanity's uh, rejection of technocracy. Um, obviously in New World of Darkness you can go down the route that they could be fetches, um, they could be people that could go on them uh, who, uh, if you make use of the book Slashes I guess, you know, you've, you've got, was Michael Myers an indigo ch child? <laughs> um, so, you, but Slashes gives you that option to look at how how as a, as a violent person continues, they almost manifest, you know, supernatural abilities. Um, maybe, the, as you say, the next stage of, of uh, evolution, actually, they're the representation of, of mankind's full acceptance of their avatar, and um, and so that's really what they're communicating with, in some respects, that full unbridled creativity. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough one, isn't it? Because obviously it's uh, it, because it's got so many links to say with like ADHD, 
and whether even ADHD is a thing or not and how you diagnose that is difficult and you know is, is it more of a case of bad parenting and using drugs to solve bad parenting or is it something else? Is it something in the water? Is it something in the breathing? So you could use them, I, I think it's maybe more tasteful to use them as, as, a, as, a, as a symptom of something larger used, rather than having them as, as, the, as the antagonists themselves. Can't really think of much more else. I think everything else is pretty much common to most World of Darkness games, really. Hmm. I like the fetch idea. Because yeah, yeah, I, I don't remember hearing much about what happens to them aside from they take the place of a changeling. Oh, fetch is a horrible, right? So for are they? Uh, yeah, for your uh, enjoyment only. Then uh, other, other <laughs> change of lost play, players are already aware of this. It sounds very aware of what fetch is. They're nasty bastards, aren't they? Um, they can be. They can yeah. be. So yeah, not always. So for all intents and purposes, a fetch generally thinks it is the person they've been used to replace, but. Their, things can go wrong. They can either become aware through their own ability that they are not human. They, or they're, they're, they ha they're basically attacked by the changeling as the changelings return to reclaim their old life. And that means they, if they can, sh I think they share the same dreams as the changeling themselves, or or think, or if they get attacked through their dreams they can attack the changeling in the same manner. Fetches can also um, eventually uh, become a true real monster because they can slowly manifest more abilities. And I think if they, they become known as a devourer, is that right, Mike? Devourer? Uh, if they do taste know. the flesh, I think if they taste the flesh of a changeling, they get a taste of the glamour and then they need more of it. So, they can become quite horrible. There's no reason they have to become horrible, obviously. There's no reason they have to become monsters. Uh, other things that are important about fetches is that they obviously have no soul because they are they were never human um, and they are sterile. Hmm. Interesting stuff. Something I would like to do, um, and of course this is something you have to be very sensitive about, but it's kind of a thought experiment almost. So, when you look at people playing, you know, Hunt of the Reckoning or something, a lot of them default to, all right, if it's a monster, let's just kill it. But let's say you're playing uh, World of Darkness Innocence, and you oh, make yeah, yeah, the yeah. Uh, Indigo Children not an antagonist, but a center of conflict. And uh, it would be interesting, interesting to see with a bunch of adult players how they react to um, these other other children. Uh, in their school or in the neighborhood, um, and they may they may seem bad, they may do bad things, but what are they going to do about it? And then you can also you could take it uh, in a uh, very wow. Now I can't remember the name of that book. What's that book when the kids are on the island? Children of uh, no. Lord of Children? the Flies. All right, you could take it in a Lord of the Flies uh, direction and have the kids isolated from all the adults and all the parents. And just see what happens and and how they react um, to this potentially supernatural situation. I think that's the that's the um, the interesting thing you've had to strike ahead there with innocence and uh, and say world and hunt of the visual and world of darkness um, asylum, which I haven't read actually. It's mostly because mainly an American approach to how to potentially deal with tasteful element in a tasteful and mature way issues that arise from mental illness and how that could be incorporated into the game. It's because, of course, Hunter has the default thing, we're here and we're going to kill the monsters. But, of course, the main actual point about Hunter is at which point does a Hunter become a monster himself and start targeting the wrong fucking people? Because then the flip side is when you're playing actual monsters like vampire or werewolf, is that when you're playing those games, you realize that though you're a vampire, you're actually acting in a far more humane way than most of the humans around you, because you're aware of how of that you could become even worse than them. So, you know, I think there's there's a definite room that you can use these concepts, but yeah, you've got to really approach it in a in a very mature and tasteful manner, because then you're also going to get down into the the slippery slope of like every mental illness is due to something horrible, spiritual, monster, and that's just cheap. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty tough subject, and of course, you can have a uh, you can use that for inspiration for a uh, situation where perhaps the parents are uh, parents of these indigo children, of course, are taking their own liberties and making choices for the child, and you have to see how the characters react. Um, you know, perhaps you could use this for inspiration in a, a vampire game where uh, these parents are seeking to heal children for uh you know maybe physical disabilities or something like that by feeding them vampire blood and effectively ghouling them and uh mm. how are the player characters going to react to that i think i think that's where it seems i think you've got there's there's a lot more interesting things to be said where you look at it look at these type of things as not as they they're not the antagonist they are the center of conflict so you're you're asking a deeper question because as i said with you know, it could be looked as as a as a, a representation of the inherent paradox of the technocracy. So you can look at, at various re- various aspects of our lives and say, within the within the, the 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 setting of mage, it's like, are these things are these things that we suffer all really a form of rejection of a utopia on some base level? And this is why you know you have have alternative therapies and alternative and, and ideas about what is possession and, and so forth and, and the scientific answers to possession and why you have these rituals is more to to create a different way to to manipulate the human consciousness to to cope with the reality around them. Um, and I think there's a lot more interesting stories to be told there because then the real conflict is between the opposing groups that feel they have the better answer to this affliction that's within humanity. So the idea of like the vampire that actually goes, I want to help these people. I want to help these children. And yet there's a bunch of vampires that go, we don't want you to do that because you're going to breach the masquerade or you're going to cause some other horrible thing to happen. Or some other monster goes, it comes in to move in because there's some collateral from it they can make well, use of. You know, they could be seen as some kind of commodity if they mm. really are that you know, psychic. Or yeah. They have power. Mm. You know, um, sort of, you know, like, um, like, in, it's been done quite a few times now, but, you know, sort of the, the cliche of a, a supernatural auction. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, trafficking, even. Uh, yeah. Children. Yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. Because, yeah, I think that that's good. It's where there's something, there's an issue, but really there is nothing supernaturally, there isn't not, it's, there's nothing supernatural about what what they are. But supernatural groups have have the completely wrong end of a stick and think there's something within it, yeah. and there is nothing. Yeah. There is nothing. But that's where the conflict comes from. Right. Nice. Dude, I like it. I think that is a. Uh, <laughs> I think of anything else. Yeah, uh, definitely a very interesting and, of course, uh, difficult subject. So uh, thanks for bringing it to the table, Chig what i'm here for right on so i think that's it for all the secret frequencies um any other closing remarks anything uh, people are excited about halloween <laughs> no. happy halloween yeah. Uh, yeah i am also playing on batman arkham origins it's okay so far so um it's interesting you know if you want some uh, if you want some good eye candy for world of darkness games batman games are always great yeah. Um, we still want to watch. Uh, it, it aired yesterday the new Dracula series, which apparently is terrible. So I'm very yeah. excited. Yeah, yeah, I, I watched <laughs> that last night. It, uh, yeah, it was as I have good heard as I expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll watch it anyway, so we can review, review it. it. Yeah. Some right. That's Might have one. eye candy. Eye candy is always good, you know, because yeah. we're, we're doing doing role play games. We're thinking shit in our heads, so sometimes visuals is just as important. Um, we finally got Hannibal in the mail, which was, not, which was oh, Hannibal is so good. Because um, it turns out that the U.S. version is the one with all the nice special features that I wanted, and I didn't realize that the U.K. version doesn't come with those special features, so I'm quite disappointed, but I'm glad we have the series and we'll probably get a multi-region player in the future so we can get the American Blu-ray. Yeah, it's definitely an excuse to have a, have a PC that has a multi-region Blu-ray. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that, of course, leads to the thing, uh, once we've watched it all, uh, which won't take very long, um, 
we'll do the we'll work out to some you can do the article of of Hannibal the lecturing so yeah. <laughs> how each of the characters can be portrayed we'll go through hunter the hunter the visual and work out like how how the characters or and, and also slashes so how each character could be a particular type of hunter how you would represent them in the game and what slasher they could become if they went too far or in the case of Hannibal's case you know he's already there so what's and the next think, stage? We'll be talking about Will Graham. Oh, Will Graham was perfect for that. Pretty much on the edge of things, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Um, yeah, that's about it at our end. Um, Pretty sweet. Hey, guess what I got in the mail? Speaking of DVDs, Kindred the Embraced. Ooh. <laughs> oh yeah. With the Book of Nod. With the Book of Nod and with commentary from the series creator. Oh shit, that's great. I really want that now. Damn. Uh, I used to watch it at about 3 a.m. Uh, on the weekends on Sky in, I don't know, I think that was like... 2001 or something? Yeah, we nice. think it was earlier than that. I think yeah. it was like 99 or something. Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's really weird when you listen to the commentary uh, by this guy, John Leakley, and he talks about like creating the world and creating the mythology, and I'm just sitting there like, are, are you going to mention White Wolf? No. Are, are you going to mention it? And he does, he does, uh, I, I watched the uh, first episode with the commentary, and he does eventually kind of mention it, and he's kind of like, yeah, thanks to White Wolf for letting me play around with your stuff, and that, and just moves on. Yeah, he did change quite a lot. Yeah, he kind of did. Although it's actually pretty interesting to listen to some of the stuff because, um, so like there's this locket that's in the first episode and I think it shows up a couple more times in the series and it's actually magical and I didn't really realize that. And it's actually, it has the, uh, the spirits touch ability, which is Auspex level three in Vampire yeah. Masquerade. Yeah. So there's actually a lot of that little stuff like thrown in there, which I never really noticed probably because the show didn't go on long enough. Actually, the funny thing is, is Kindred the Embrace now technically going to be closer to Vampire the Requiem? Considering Vampire the Requiem with Blood and Smoke, you will have now rules because of the way they've done blood potency and humanity that vampires actually, to a limited degree, can daywalk because it's based on yep. their corruption of their soul. So it's actually going to be interesting when Blood and Smoke comes, back, comes out. We're going to have to go back and look at Kindred the Embrace and go, well, actually... It's kind of useful. Yeah, you might have a valid point there, Chris. I don't know if anybody has to go back to Kindred the Embrace. Chig, Chig, well, you said we were going to do riff tracks. You said we were going to record riff tracks for this. Oh, God, I did agree to that, didn't I? Yep. It's either that or we watch uh, Bloody True Blood. I don't know I'm doing that. No. Uh, True Blood can go piss off. Um, is there any other good... Uh, we need to watch more Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. Uh... uh... We did start watching season eight of Supernatural so far. Yeah, you know, it's more the same. I'm so done with Supernatural. I do need to write a post about why I stopped watching Supernatural, but mm. I will do that at some point in the future because it's way too much to go into right now. Season eight's better than season six and season seven. Oh, oh season seven. I, I didn't know because I barely watched them. <laughs> I think I stopped watching in about season five or so, and I should, mm. like, every time I go back, I... I start watching it and I I just don't really watch it properly enough to know what's going on. So I end up asking Chris, you know, what just happened? And then he tells me and I, I forget straight away because actually I really don't care. So I think that's what I'm going to say. It's it's I season, want to care, but I don't. It's because seasons one and two of that show were pretty much gold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. I like season three. I like season four. I like season five, but I pretend that it ends, you know, two minutes yep. before the credits in the last episode. Basically, yeah, it just ends with it. Dean sitting there eating some meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> just cut yeah. to black. <laughs> oh, interesting show that um, because of the, what I was researching for the uh, Alchemist thing um, that I'm, I don't know, maybe something I have to buy or I hope it turns up on Netflix as BBC puts more and more of their content on there. Um, see, it had three series. Uh, they're basically six episodes in, uh, in length each series. Sea of Souls, it covers a Scottish-based paranormal research group. So that's basically asking for a, a World of Darkness treatment because there seems to be some weird stuff in it. Uh, 
Yeah, I didn't ever hmm. watch all of it, but I, I think I watched a couple of them and they really creeped me out, and that's saying quite a lot. So. <laughs> and this is BBC. This is BBC. I think before the reboot of Doctor Who, so I feel the series back then were because they didn't have quite try, weren't trying to go for quite the same certain I would say standards of say more American TV that have retained something a, 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 a sort of quintessential creepiness that's there like with Neverwhere as well that has a certain uh, a, a mood and kind of uh, look to it so yeah it'll be interesting to look at that as well absolutely so with all of those uh, TV show recommendations <laughs> this has been Darker Days Radio. Uh, you can check us out at uh, darker-days.org. That's our website. You can uh, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash darkerdaysradio. And then if you go on G+, we're, of course, the, the Darker Days Radio community where we do uh, a, lot of, a lot of solid discussion and uh, people run games, even though my Tremere Chronicle got canceled last weekend. Oh man! Uh, yeah, we've got two. We've got over two hundred members finally. So, yeah. we, yeah, even though we may well only be one of the smallest world of darkness communities out there, we're the most active. So, that says more about what we do. Absolutely, quality, not quantity. It's, it's quality. Well, it's all quality as well. Um, and we're on Twitter, of course, um, at Dark Days Radio. And do we have something else? We have a blog. I have a blog. Hello it's Crossbow. Called Hello Crossbow. You should go look at it because it's okay. It has movie <laughs> reviews. It has movie reviews. It has uh, Gossip Ghoul. Gossip Ghoul is so good. Yeah, it, it's it's got a whole mishmash of stuff. Rose Bailey it, really it, likes it. It's got horror and it's got interesting stuff about my life and it's got style and everything pretty much <laughs> yeah it's great um oh, is that it <laughs> i think just about it is yeah we've got a lot of things all over the place but uh yeah we'll centralize it eventually so i uh i think that's it for this episode guys thank you very much and you all have a good night bye, bye.